Let's pray. Lord God, you invite us to faithfully follow after you, even amidst the dysfunction that we often find ourselves in in our families. Help us to cling to the promises that your word gives us today. In your name we pray. Amen. Sometimes a sermon title is intentionally evocative. Like, you throw it out there with the hopes that maybe it piques somebody's interest and they think, wait a minute, where's he going with that? Which is intentionally what I did today. The sermon title is The Other Woman. And just out of curiosity, like, where does your mind go when you hear a phrase like that? Most of us would say that our minds go to to maybe some sort of affair that is happening behind the scenes in a marriage. And so you've got a man who's married to a woman, and yet somehow there's some dysfunction that's there. There's a a need that's not being met. And, And because of that gap in that relationship, the husband now turns to another woman. Unfortunately, this is what we see happen many times in families today. And it wreaks havoc on the God-ordained order of one man, one woman, and their children. But this is what we're going to see today as we continue through our teaching series on the family of origin. So just a quick review, a quick quiz for us this morning Uh, Over the last couple of weeks, we've been taking a look at that original family that that God proclaimed his promises to, of a husband, a wife, and then last week we were introduced to their son. You remember the name of the husband? Abraham. What about his wife? Sarah. And then his son, Isaac. But what if I told you that there's another story that runs parallel to this? A story that involves another woman named Hagar and another son named Ishmael. By the way, it was fascinating as we were talking about this text as a staff that one of the staff threw out how When we give names to our children, especially biblical names, there are certain names that we latch on to that are quite common, and then there are other names that we really try to avoid. So, how many of you know somebody named Sarah? Quite a few of us, right? Multiple Sarahs. It's a very, very common, popular name. How many of you know somebody named Hagar? I didn't think so. What about Isaac? Yeah, I know a few Isaacs in my life, but you know what? I don't know any Ishmaels. And yet what we're going to see is in this story, there's God's grace even for the other woman, even for the other son. So we're going to be in two different chapters in Genesis as we look at the story of Hagar. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 16, and then we're going to flip over to Genesis chapter 21. So let's get started in Genesis 16. Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abraham, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abraham had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarah took his wife, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. Now, let's recall God's original plan as we're looking at this story. Three times to this point in the book of Genesis, God has come to Abraham and said, I'm going to give you descendants, as numerous as the stars in the sky, the sands on the seashore. And yet, after ten years of waiting... Nothing. Abraham and Sarah remain childless. And this is where Sarah decides to take God's plans into her own hands and make a few adjustments. Uh, By the way, whenever you start to do that, whenever you take what God has clearly proclaimed through his word and you start to tweak it and make adjustments to it, watch out. Because you are in T-R-O-U-B-L-E. You are in trouble. Trouble. 
So here's Sarah, and she's trying to sort this out. She's trying to make sense of the fact that, that she doesn't have any children yet, even though God has promised that. And in her mind, she logically thinks, you know what, maybe it's not through me. Because the promise has come to Abraham. God, to this point, has not directly come to Sarah and said, Sarah, you will be a mother of many nations. No, he's simply come to Abraham. Her name hasn't been mentioned yet. So she resorts to a very common cultural practice of surrogacy, which means that you would take one of your servants, one of your maids, you would give them in marriage to your husband, he would bear a child, and you would raise that child in your name. It was approved by everybody in that culture, except for God. So Sarah takes this, and, and makes a proposition to her husband, Abraham. And what's his response? Okay. Which is where he gets himself in trouble. So men, generally speaking, it is good biblical wisdom to listen to your wife, right? <laughs> Try to understand where her heart is at. Try to see things from her perspective, but not always. Sometimes you shouldn't listen to your wife. Now, don't take that out of context this morning, please. You can think back earlier in the book of Genesis to where a man was presented with forbidden fruit. And rather than pushing back, rather than saying, uh, honey, are you sure that God said this is okay? He simply took it and ate it. And now here's a repeat of that very same thing as Sarah takes a forbidden female and presents her to her husband and Abraham does what? He simply agrees to it. But lest we put some of the blame on Hagar, Hagar is the victim here in this story. Hagar doesn't have a voice. She's a slave girl. When the boss says to do something, you do it. This is an unfortunate power structure in the ancient world that we have to wrestle with in this story. Let's keep reading. Let's see what happens. When Hagar knew that she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress now here's where Hagar slips into being in the wrong because she, she gets that glow of being a pregnant woman and it leads her to begin to gloat as if somehow God has shown her more favor than her mistress. So then Sarah said to Abraham, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. By the way, whose idea was it originally? It wasn't Abraham's idea. It was Sarah's idea. And so now here, she's passing the blame. Just like verses earlier, she's blaming God for the fact that she doesn't have any children. Now she's blaming Abraham for the fact that her, mistre, her, her maid now despises her. I put your slave in your arms, and now that she knows that she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abraham said. Do with her what you think best. Then Sarah mistreated Hagar. That word mistreated, we see it again in Scripture as we get to the book of Exodus as God's people are enslaved in Egypt and they're mistreated by their slave drivers. This is what Sarah does to Hagar. And so what's Hagar's response? It's what so many women today who find themselves mistreated do. They leave. They flee. It says, so she fled from her. But it's here, in her fleeing, that something happens. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near the spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. So Shur is a desert which is in the northeast side of of Egypt. This is where Hagar is from. So Hagar is simply fleeing to go back to her family. And it's as she is fleeing that the angel of the Lord, maybe the pre-incarnate Christ, but some manifestation of God shows up to her. 
And she's heard the stories of how God has appeared to her master, Abraham, but now God personally comes to her. And he said, Hagar, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so that they will be too numerous to count. So she finds herself banished and God comes to her and promises her blessing. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son and you shall name him Ishmael. You look in your Bible at the footnote, what does it say? Ishmael means God hears, which is an intentional play on words because notice what follows. For the Lord has heard your misery. God says, you think nobody hears you? I hear you. And for the rest of your life, as you coo and cuddle over your little boy, I want you to remember that I am a God who hears you. And then her response as God gave a name to her son, now she gives a name to God, which is, which is fascinating because this is the only time in the entire Old Testament that someone gives a name to God, male or female. And of all the people who choose to give a name to God, it's Hagar, a slave woman. Verse 13, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. In Hebrew, it's El Roy. You think you're unseen. You think you're unheard. You think you're unwanted. You're not. I see you. I hear you. I want you. That's the gospel in this story. And so, we see that Hagar goes back home to her mistress, back home to Sarah, and years later, God comes to Abraham and Sarah now and says, it is through Sarah that you will have children. And Sarah's response, and we heard this last week, she laughs. <laughs> yeah, right. An unlikely story. That's not going to happen. And God says, no, it's true. And in a year, I will come back and you will have a son. And you will give him the name Isaac. Because Isaac means Laughter. So Sarah goes from laughing at God to now laughing with God as she holds her little son. But there's a little bit of a twist in the story. There's a little bit of, uh, let's call it mama drama, that's brewing behind the scenes. So Genesis chapter 21 Pick it up at verse 8. The child Isaac grew and was weaned. So he's probably two or three years old at this point in time. And on the day that he was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham was mocking. It's the same root word for Isaac's name, laughter. Now Isaac, the one who brings laughter to others, is being laughed at. He's being mocked by Ishmael. And Ishmael at this point in time is probably 15, 16 years old. And why is he mocking Isaac? It's because he's jealous. And we see this, we get this in family dynamics, especially in a world where you see broken families, where you've got a husband and wife who split up, they divorce, they have children together, but then one or both of them remarries, they start families of their own, and now what happens? those older half-siblings now begin to feel like somebody else is getting more of the attention. Somebody else is getting more of the affection. And so they're jealous. Same thing here. And so Sarah said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son but God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you. Because she's right this time. It's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also. Because he is your offspring. 
Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. A little bit of deja vu here, isn't it? Like you go back to Genesis chapter 16, and what happens? There's animosity between the women, which leads to Hagar being kicked out. First time she leaves on her own. Second time she's kicked to the curb by Sarah. And then she's left to wander in the wilderness. And yet what happens? When the water and the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. I mean, what a tough spot to be. Nobody wants to watch their son die of dehydration in the desert. And so she goes off away from her son and waits, waits for him to die. And it's there that there's a little more deja vu. Because as Hagar is wandering in the wilderness, God appears to her. Verse 17, God heard the boy crying. And what what does the name Ishmael mean? God hears. So, true to his name, God hears the boy crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. There's banishment and yet there's blessing. We see it repeated. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy as he grew up. So, what do we glean from this story? Here are some takeaways for us this morning. And the first is this. Distrust of God leads to dysfunction in the family. I mean, you look at this story and all of the jealousy and all of the quarreling and all of the pain that is inflicted. And what's the source of it? It's all because two people chose not to trust the plan that God had for them. And you wonder, okay, so whatever happened to Ishmael? Well, Genesis 16, 12 gives us a little clue. It says, he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. And those words are true. Because what has followed from this story is a 4,000 year family feud that continues to this day. It begins just a few chapters later in Genesis chapter 37. We see the Ishmaelites show up as Abraham's great grandson Joseph finds himself being sold off to a group of slave traders. Who are these slave traders? They're Ishmaelites. And from that moment forward, the Ishmaelites continue to be a thorn in the side to God's people, whether the Old Testament Jews or the New Testament Christians. Who are the Ishmaelites today? The Arabs, the Muslims. What are the two largest religions in the world that are at odds with each other today? Christians and Muslims. Christians trace their roots back to Abraham and Isaac. Who do the Muslims trace their roots back to? Abraham and Ishmael. And it makes you wonder, if Abraham and Sarah knew that that one decision not to trust the plan that God had for them would lead to this level of dysfunction, would they have still done it? And that's a word of warning for us. Because the same thing is true. When we choose to distrust what God has clearly laid out in his word and we take that into our own hands, especially when it comes to how we choose to define the family, 
When we take that into our own hands, when we distort that, when we choose not to trust God, it leads to layers and layers and layers of dysfunction in our families, in our communities, even in our churches. Distrust of God leads to dysfunction in families. And yet, and yet even in the midst of that, God still reiterates his promises to us. There is grace for the other woman. There is grace for the other son. And that's the second way, takeaway for us, is that God sees and hears the cry of the other woman. That's what's reiterated throughout the story. Ishmael means what? God hears. Hagar gives a name to God. You are the God who sees me. And for all of the other women out there, for all those who have been kicked to the curb, who have been disregarded, who don't have a voice, where something has been forced upon them, and some of you, you might be those women. For all of those other women out there, this is good news. So there's an Old Testament scholar named Phyllis Tribble, and she writes this of this passage. All sorts of rejected women find their stories in Hagar. She is the faithful maid exploited, the black woman used by the male and abused by the female of the ruling class, the surrogate mother, the resident alien without legal recourse, the other woman, the pregnant young woman alone, the expelled wife, the divorced mother with child, the welfare mother, women who are just trying to get by, women who have been shamed, women who don't have a voice. And God says, I see you. I hear you. You might feel like you are unwanted, but I want you to know I want a relationship with you. Here's the third takeaway. Because of the promised child. And that's really the the question in this entire text is, who is the promised child? Is it Ishmael or is it Isaac? And the ultimate answer is, the promised child is Jesus. And so because of that promised child, that seed of Abraham, yes, it comes through Isaac, but because of that promised seed, all of us are children of promise. Even Ishmael is a child of the promise because Ishmael is circumcised. And that's a sign, a mark of the covenant. This is why God comes to him. This is why God hears his cries. He says, you, even though you've been rejected and dejected, you are still mine. You are still a child of the promise. And he blesses him. And this is ultimately what God does for all of us in Jesus. He hears our cries. He sees us. And even when we feel banished, He still blesses us. He calls us a child of the promise. So here's the final thing that we need to know from this story today is that only Jesus is good to everybody. I mean, you look at this story, Abraham is not good to everybody. Sarah is not good to everybody. Hagar is not good to everybody. Ishmael is not good to everybody. They are all at fault in some way, shape, or form for this level of dysfunction and chaos that we find in this family. But in all of our families, the only one who is good to everybody is Jesus. And that's the God that we cling to. Amidst all of the family dysfunction, amidst the triangulation that we find ourselves facing in relationships, amidst all those feelings of being unwanted, amidst the labels of being the other woman or the illegitimate child, we look to Jesus, the one who is the promised child, the one who himself was kicked to the curb, who himself was rejected and dejected at the cross in order that all of us might receive his promises, in order that all of us might know that we are seen, we are heard, we are loved, we are wanted, we are children of the promise. Amen.